Every part of comics and artwork is a form of communication with other people. It's not just a, here, let me direct my thoughts at you as a dictation of concept, but it's hoping to convince you of how cool you think a visual could be or a story could be. And you're trying to communicate ideas and in one part storytelling and greater part just graphic impact. You're hoping to relate a sense of energy, urgency, and enthusiasm to people. That there's a lightning of spirit that comes out of superheroes that has always worked for me. That it isn't really about the practicality of what they might do. About It's not the practicality about grown men punching each other in costumes. It really isn't about that. It's a visual metaphor. And that metaphor could be for a lot of things, but it's mostly just about the energy and enthusiasm that can be found in the fun of life. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Really excited about today's conversation because I've been a fan of uh, today's guest for a long time, going back uh, to his uh, work on, uh, and I want to get his official title of what he was doing on Free Enterprise, I believe, uh, executive producer. But uh, he hosts several of my favorite podcasts. He is about to embark on a very interesting uh, uh, documentary that a Kickstarter campaign is underway for. Uh, asking the question, was 1982 the greatest geek year ever? So he's waiting right now backstage. Let's bring him in. It's Mark A. Altman. Hey, Mark, John. How are you? Good. Really great to meet you, Mark. Congratulations on... Uh, a lot of your projects. What was your title on Free Enterprise? Forgive me. Well, I was a producer and I was a writer. So There you go. I've had Rob on Burnett to talk about this uh, several times. And, uh, of course, we get into our Star Trek uh, discussions, as you do on uh, some of your fantastic podcasts, including the Inglorious Trexperts. There's a good family photo right there. Not, mm -hmm. only, on the, not only on the Electric Surge uh, network. Is that on... Which uh, streamer is Electric Surge on, man? Well, Electric Surge is where the video podcasts are, and they um, it streams on everything from IMDb TV to Stir, Distro TV. There's the Electric Now app. Um, so all our podcasts are on Electric Now, as well as episodes of Librarians and Leverage and The Outpost, and uh, uh, it's a great streaming app for video. And then, of course, the podcasts are also available through usual means, any podcast provider. Yeah, um, man. No, I'm there every Friday. I I'm in the midst of uh, today's Inglorious Trexperts episode where you've got uh, the original casting director for not only uh, the Star Trek original series, but even goes back to podcasts. It's a long one. It's That's a, I'm, it's hey, that to three hours. Hey, I, I uh, those are always welcome to listen to, and uh, I I won't I won't keep you before your dinner time tonight. But uh, <laughs> Rob and I have been known to uh, to go on forever about. Uh, a lot of the same stuff. We're close enough in the in ages. I think you're a little younger than me. I'm 56, but oh, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm in I'm I'm in my late 20s. So there you yeah, at a point, there you go. <laughs> we grew up in the same era, it seems, with a lot of uh, a lot of the stuff you cover on uh, not only uh, Trexperts but also uh, the 4:30 movie. Yeah, another, that's another podcast, which is uh, I love doing, where we curate fantasy theme weeks of uh, classic movies. You know, last week we did New York State of Mind week, which was New York movies and. Darren at the end of the podcast jokingly said, "Oh, next week we should do L.A." So we did that to live and die in L.A. week this week. So that was oh, that's great, fun. excellent, man, very, very cool. Uh, I understand because I'm like that with Chicago movies, being from uh, <laughs> being from Chicago and living in Chicago. Come on, uh, Continental awesome. Divide, Chicago, Abe Froman, absolutely, <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so here, I want to go through the uh, the class picture the here. Yeah. So you are second from the left, and then is that uh, is that Ashley next to you? It's Ashley Miller standing next to me, who wrote Thor and X Men First Class, and is a frequent guest on Trexperts. And uh, 
Then uh, next to me is Darren Docterman, my co-host uh, on uh, Trexperts, and also he was the uh, visual effects supervisor on the Star Trek The Motion Picture Director's Edition, and is a concept artist for uh, like Riddick and Westworld and a whole bunch of stuff. And Steve Belching, who uh, wrote for The Clone Wars and Rebels and X-Men the Animated Series, and he was just guest starring on this episode when we took this picture. I don't, I don't even remember which episode it was. <laughs> Fair enough, but uh, I'll tell you, no, I really enjoy the interplay between yourself and Darren and Ashley. You guys are kind of the regulars. Rob pops in occasionally. You pops do have a great. It's always good to have Rob uh, drop by. You got great guests. Uh, I heard a, a few weeks ago you had her back. You've got an, in addition to the regular Inglorious Trexpert show, uh, the episode commentary show, which is called yeah Trexpert's Briefing Room, which we launched like two or three months ago. You know, we you know, during the the height of the pandemic. And uh, it's audio commentaries for significant Star Trek episodes. And we bring in writers, producers, super fans. And um, we got Brian Fuller coming for Bride of Chaotica with Voyager. We had Brian Braga do, um, do cause and effect, but I really wanted him to do Sub Rosa. We just did Fox <laughs> Brain. I think Goodman did the Apple. Um, we did, uh, Mike what? Susskind did the, uh, in the, in the, um, in a Mirror Darkly. So we've been, we even did a Discovery episode with uh, Jesse Alexander and, Aaron uh, Colette, uh, one of their first season episodes. That's excellent. And I really loved uh, you guys with Brian Volk Weiss doing uh, Chain of oh, Command. Command. Yeah, that was fun. Hilarious. Brian, you know, Brian's great. And he is a, he's a Die in the Wheel Trek fan. And um, uh, we had a great time doing that Chain of Command commentary. So it's interesting. I, 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 didn't, I wasn't really looking to do another podcast. And it sort of came about as a lark. And now somehow we've committed to this weekly schedule. And it's, it's, it's brutal, but uh, but we're having fun. You know, I'll, I'll keep doing it as long as we have fun. Because hey. when Trexpert's going is, is is insane. But we got some great guests coming up, and Joe D'Augusta was one of them. And we we're doing an episode. Of, we're doing our first two part episode in a couple of weeks, which is uh, we have Gene Roddenberry's notes from uh, Star Trek Three and the studio notes, and Gene Roddenberry to Hart Bennett. So it, we recorded it was like five hours, and we said we just got to break this one up because it's, <laughs> it's insane. Well, as a, an old radio guy that loves to mimic things, uh, I love that Darren has uh, cracked the code on uh, Roddenberry, and oh. nobody nobody does it as well as Darren. But I I do try to follow his bru uh, blueprint. I will not embarrass myself today, <laughs> but I'll just tell you that uh, I I do really. It's like, oh, that's how you do it. Okay, fine. And you know, good, doing mimicking a voice, it's a lot like singing. It's either in your range or it's it's not. Now, so Darren, uh, it's it's it's. Um... It's just, it's incredible. I mean, he is, he's a freak of nature. I mean, the Monbury voice is incredible. And I mean, he's pulled it out on like Shatner and I mean, the best really? Rod Roddenberry at a bachelor party when he was getting something, with, you know, a tawdry was going on and uh, he, he did, and, and, and Rod lit up and it was, it was actually Rob's bachelor party. And I mean, this many years ago. And, okay. uh, I, and it was, he, and I forgot, I totally forgot about it. And Dan mentioned it on this week's show. And I'm like, Oh my God! Yes, I remember that. So, um, Darren is incredible. One of my favorite episodes we did was where we did a deep dive into the novelization of Star Trek: The Motion Picture, and he read like all the parts, like <laughs> De Kelly and Persis. I mean, it was great. It was absolutely great. That was awesome. And also, I loved the speculation of what would have been uh, the original series' fourth season, and oh, you guys yeah. kind of went through that. That was a great episode as well. I've, I yeah, we. Um, you know, we're always looking, you know, we try and have a mix, particularly now that we're doing a via Zoom and not in studio. So a mix of like interviews, deep dives with people who either worked on the show or significant figures in Trek history. And then just the bullshit episodes where we sure. sit around and, 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 and BS and talk about, you know, uh, the essential Kirk episodes or, um, you know, uh, best aliens or, you know, whatever, whatever we do. Um, and it's funny because there is, you know, I, I work so hard to get the, um, the interviews and then uh, we end up uh, having all these people say, I like the episodes where you guys just sit around and BS. It's like, can't win. No, no. I mean, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm easy to please because, again, it's always great to hear a great Trek discussion amongst people who really are passionate about the show, know their stuff. I am constantly learning, listening to your show. Oh, that's and good. Absolutely, man. Well, I know uh, also one of the main things you want to talk about today, and uh, let's get into it. you got a Kickstarter campaign going on for a really great idea for a documentary. Now, I've seen several of you uh, at Comic-Con do panels on this subject as well. Right. But uh, And I, I, I'm reasonably certain one of the years you had to have covered 
1982. And you're asking the question, was 19 or, or I guess, making the Are argument. Decided? We're not asking. <laughs> yes. It, uh, yes. According to you guys, it was the greatest geek year ever. And yeah, I mean, again, just looking at uh, your poster here. And all the various films that are, I see Rocky Three. of course, I see Star Trek II. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've heard your commercial prior to the start of your podcast. Uh, go ahead and uh, list a bunch of other obvious films that are that are yeah, in there, or television. Or Crystal, you know, Low Lying Fruit is, you know, E.T., which opened today, 39 years ago. Wow. Uh, Star Trek II, Poltergeist. But, you know, then there's the more obscure stuff. The Thing, of course, Blade Runner, but, um, you know, Tron. But then there's stuff like Time Rider and Megaforce and Halloween three and the remake of Cat People and you know uh, Q the Winged Serpent and and Forbidden World and you know mainstream movies like The Verdict which is one of my favorite Paul Newman movies and Mr. Harvest film uh, and you know Fast Times which Entertainment uh, Weekly called the you know Citizen Kane of teen exploitation films so, I mean so <laughs> many so many great uh, 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 films that came out that year for you know in every genre like we're leading with the geek stuff but I mean. You know, is Rocky Three really geek? Yeah, you know, forty-eight hours. I, I mean, it's, it's it's the list is so the king of comedy. I mean, it's insane. You know, so um, it really is a, a spectacular thing. And and you know, I had done um, I had done a uh, uh, um, curated uh, 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 a weekend or it was like a five-day event at the American Cinematheque. I don't know, fifteen years ago for nineteen eighty-two for I guess what was the uh, the thirtieth anniversary of nineteen eighty-two, and um, you know, showed Dark Crystal and The Thing and Blade Runner and Star Trek Two and Poltergeist and, and and had like great guests from all these movies. I mean, back when, you know, so many people were still alive. I mean, it was really extraordinary. And um, Tron and I, I was like, I, and I didn't videotape it. I didn't do anything. You know? uh. And it was like, oh, what was I thinking? And, uh, and it was extraordinary. And afterwards, even then, I'm like, oh, I wish I had that on tape. I mean, even, you know, had my my phone out, to, it would have been nice. But um <laughs> but uh, it was extraordinary, and 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 then we did you know our first panel uh, 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 devoted to the subject of Comic Con, where we did the 1982 Greatest Geek Year Ever, and that was like standing room only, and people loved it. And every year we've done since then 1983, 1984, 1985, and it's it's interesting because it's carried through all these years. And we did 1989 two years ago, and when Comic Con at Home came to me, we kind of deciding. Do we go to 1990 or do we go back and do 71 or 81? And we decided let's do 81. So Good. For, on at home, we did 81, which is also an extraordinary year. You know, American Werewolf in London, Excalibur, Heavy Metal. Um, you know, it's, it, again, a really deep Clash of the Titans. Really, really great, uh, uh, great year. So we did that, and that's going to debut at Comic-Con at home. And then I guess we're going to go back and do 1982 next year. Hopefully it'll tie in with the documentary which hopefully we'll be promoting. It depends on whether or not we hit our goal on, on, uh, on Kickstarter. Understood. And yeah, uh, that's, that's great to hear. Okay. So, so this next month you're going to be doing comic Con at home and doing, uh, yeah, 1981. 1981. That's great. Uh, a week, uh, you know, under the four thirty movie brand. And then, you know, hopefully next year we'll revisit 1982 in some form or fashion as part of promoting the, you know, the release of the documentary. Which uh, you know uh, will we'll hopefully be starting on that next. We, you know we've already re gotten some stuff, but we're re you know assuming it funds, we'll really be pursuing that aggressively starting next week. You know next month. Okay, and here these are your uh, cohorts for. Uh, yeah, for, my uh, to crime. Uh, Scott Mance, who is film critic for Axis Hollywood, he's a very well respected film critic. Obviously, a big Star Trek fan, um, and he's part of it. And then of course Roger Lay, who did the Roddenberry Vault and all the. Uh, Star Trek special features for Next Generation and for Enterprise. And, uh, um, you know, he actually, uh, uh, you know, so the three of us are, are producing this with Tom Vitale, my partner on um, uh, Pandora. And um, it's very, you know, it's very exciting. It's just something I felt very passionate about for a long time. And hopefully um, we'll, uh, we'll make our goal and be able to put this into production. Absolutely, man. No, I, I do hope you do reach your goal. And that's why I'm happy to help you promote this and i'll be not not only on the video but of course on on war balloons audio podcast as well we'll take uh, the audio and have that out there this weekend talking about it um and again um i think the three of you guys are the right people for this because uh in addition to uh what you guys do at uh, comic-con every year you guys do these incredible you and roger in particular do these incredible oral histories 
And man, I'll tell you, 50 Year Mission, both volumes, there it is, and literally does lay out that entire history of Star Trek pre production all the way through the initial pre production notes of uh, Discovery. And John, it's, uh, turning into This Is Your Life here. Yeah. I don't, I, and that, yeah who, do you recognize I, I, this voice? Exactly. I, I, I appreciate it. I, I'm so proud of those books of 50 Year Mission. I was very reluctant to, um, to you know, look, at, at the time, this is five years ago or more um, when we wrote them, um, and Ed Gross came to me and he said, look, you know, let's do something for the 50th. And, you know, I, I really don't have a ton of time and, you know, I'm you know, producing a lot of TV and movies yeah. and stuff. So I, I kind of was like, no. And he kept asking me and I kept saying no. And, um, and it, time was getting short. And, you know, it's funny because it was one of these real synchronicities. I read this book, I Want My MTV. It was an oral history of MTV. And I loved it because it was yes. informative. It was sweet. It was funny. It was tragic. It was just amazing. And I thought, wow, this is a really cool way to tell the story. And I said, you know, maybe we could do that with Star Trek. So I called up Ed and I said to Ed, I said, you know, I have an idea. I'm not saying I'm going to do the book. But I'm saying that if we did it like it's an oral history and our agent can get a, a you know good enough deal, then I consider it. So you know we, we so he immediately went to our agent and then she shopped and she sold like in a day and and then I was stuck writing it and then I said to Ed, which he agreed, was um, look Ed, if we do this, it got to be the best book ever written on Star Trek. I'm not I don't want to write the, the third best book on Star Trek. You know, um, it got to be it got to be great. And so, um, hello. what happened? Nice. There you go. Did you I don't turn know that, that on or did I do that? I think you just did that. Oh but that's God. fantastic. How Let's hear. That? And now a break from Asia. Here's Heat of the Moment, everybody. Uh, yeah, oh, my God. I accidentally hit. Uh, that was not intentional. I'm just an idiot. So, um, that oh, was I, great. It's so funny. Um, and it was, it was short enough that you don't have to clear it. So, exactly. uh, <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, so I said, it got to be the best book ever written about Star Trek, which is you know, hard. There are a lot of really great books written about Star Trek. And um, we, we wrote it and it was a monster, you know, a monster because it was supposed to be one book. And we, we, we called up the uh, editor and we said, uh, we have good news and bad news. The good news is we're done. The bad news is it's too long. We think um, it should be two books. And he said, I'll be the judge of that. He was very, very wary of this. And um, he read it. And that Monday, we got an email. All it said is, it's two books. So um, that was wonderful. And then it came out, and the response was incredible. Uh, and, and it sold extremely well. And I'm, I'm like I said, I'm really proud of, uh, of those books. And then, of course, we've done a bunch since. You know, we did uh, Buffy and Angel book. We did. The Galactica book, which is a lot of fun. The Bond book, which is probably my favorite next to is. the Star Trek book or on par with the Star Trek book. And then um, we, you know, of course, have the Star Wars book coming out in July, Secrets of the Force, uh, which I heard today is already number one on Kindle. Hey, know? awesome. That's it's great. Like, I'm like, what? I said it didn't even come out yet. So um, so that's cool. That's um, fantastic. Yeah. And, and this was also one. This is when we, we also are like, well, you know, it really should be two books. And they're like, no, we want – the whole selling point is the entire Star Wars saga in one book, so it got to be one book. And I'm like, oh, okay. So uh, – but I, I think I think it turned out really well. But, um, but yeah, so it's been crazy. I keep – I sound Michael Corleone. I keep trying to get out, but they keep pulling me back in, you know? <laughs> and and uh, so uh, anyway, but uh, this yeah, the Star Trek book was, uh, was, was just an sh extraordinary experience. And – you know, we really got a lot of people right as sadly a lot of people were passing away. We like to joke we were like the angels of death. We would interview somebody and then shortly thereafter they would pass away or they pass, you know, it was it was really challenging. But um sure. It's, you know, it's fifty years. It's fifty years when we you know, so right. Um but I I, I just think it it um you know, it's an adult book about Star Trek. I said it's candid without being gossipy. Okay. Um and uh, I think it's very fair. I think the oral history is, is great because it's like Rashomon. We as the authors don't have to say, this is the way it happened. You can hear three different people telling three different stories and you get to, the reader, get to decide which is true. Who knows, you know? Um, I do. You have to be the referee. So I really, I love that about oral histories. 
Hey man, uh, honestly, you you've in an inadvertent way ex- inspired me to do a, a Chicago retrospective and do an oral history. I'm going to do it as a podcast. I'm a lazy writer, Mark. I uh, I'm I'm really good at doing this. I've I've done I've done radio broadcasting for for over 30 years and done a lot of interviews and I'm very comfortable doing audio. But then to actually write, it's kind of like Hitchcock. Now I got to make the thing. Right. You know, it's in my. I have already storyboarded it out. And I actually got to make the thing, and it's like oh. So uh, I, I can definitely relate, but this com- Secrets of the Force comes out in July, right? This comes out in July. It comes out early next month. That's great. So it's a big, uh, it's a big summer because we have, um, you know, obviously the Kickstarter going on, the book coming out. You know, uh, I'm going to be uh, with uh, Darren. I'm going to my first Star Trek convention in years, and we're going to be at the uh, 55. Uh, 55 uh, year mission uh, in Vegas, the big Vegas convention, which I haven't been to in probably 10 years. Um, but they were very, Adam and Gary really wanted me to come and Darren was going and he really wanted me to come. And I'm like, you know what? I, I, especially since there's no San Diego Comic Con this year and I'm vaccinated and things, you know, like, sure. I'm like, sure, I'll go this year. So, um, so I'm going to go to Vegas in August for the big Star Trek convention. Um, so it'll be interesting. That's great, man. No, I, I hear you. I'm uh, my first Comic Con is uh, back is it's going to start in August at uh, Terrificon in Connecticut. Oh yeah, M- uh, Mitchell Halleck. Mitch Halleck, absolutely. But he, by the way, he says hello. He remembers fondly uh, being at uh, one of the at, in New York for the Prince Junket for your series Femme Fatales. And oh, yeah. uh, I think he was also he was at the um, the junket on either for Agent X or for. Um, he might have been. I think he might have been there for Pandora, if I remember last. Time. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Hey, man. Honestly, I I keep meaning. Is Agent X streaming anywhere? By the way. Yeah, I think it's on Hulu. Okay, I yeah. got I I keep meaning to readdress that show because I I remember that Pandora. Uh, you've had two seasons. Yeah. And uh, there's the cast right there. Um, I uh, I, do we know? I mean, are you have what's happening? Is there going to be a? Oh, we haven't made an official announcement. All I can say is there's good news forthcoming. Fantastic, uh, wonderful. I can't, I can't say much more about the third season. Well, yeah, regarding season uh, three, we will we will be uh, announcing some news soon. But there are just certain details that need to be ironed out before we can officially announce it. But um, it's uh, I'm excited because uh, you know obviously third season for Next Generation was where it really hit its stride, and I'm very proud of the work we did the first two seasons. You know, with very little money, and I think with the third season, it's uh, we can do some incredible stuff. And you know, the first uh, season, it was really, um, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, second season, we really ha- we produced the height of COVID, so it was very challenging. And you know, it'd be nice to go back to actually having big, uh, uh, big extra scenes and uh, not testing every every couple of days uh, for uh, you know COVID and. You know, it takes a big chunk of the budget too. Twenty percent goes to COVID mitigation, so that was rough, especially for a show that already has a pretty small budget. So, and you, and you shoot in Bulgaria, and um, I, I'm almost, I'm, I'm always fascinated by you know shooting in places like Bulgaria. Um, like, yeah, what uh, you know, moving forward, are they, are they, have they been deemed safe? Are they, uh, you know, is it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you Europe, know. You know, Europe is now, you know, Europe was way ahead of us. Like, when we were shooting, it was much safer to be in Sophia than it was to be in L.A. Okay. You know, that is, that's changed a little bit now because, obviously, L.A. is one of the safer cities on Earth right now in terms of COVID. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, I will say that I think by the time we're shooting, say, theoretically, we're shooting in fall, say that maybe, let's just pretend. Perhaps. And, uh, you know, that I think it'll be, it'll be fine. And... Um, you know, it's a really interesting place. I've had a really great experience shooting there. I mean, it was a really tough situation because we got greenlit by the CW in February, and we had to be on the air in July. So wow, we literally got greenlit, and then you know we were shooting in April of what I think 2019, and then on the air in originally it was be June, and it ended up being July. So we had this you know ridiculous you know so the amount of time we had to build sets that first season and get up and running and cast, and it was it was crazy. So you know. I, I feel like uh, you know, second season it was a little better uh, in terms of us having more time and uh, more planning, and um, third season even more so. So uh, it's exciting, and people can catch up if they want. The first two seasons they're streaming on Amazon, Amazon Prime. Yeah, so it's yeah. free, no commercials. You got a 4K set; it's screaming in 4K. And then, given the amount of time we spent on color timing and sound mix for the high, watch that. 
<laughs> because you know, it, I mean, I watch. I made the mistake of watching some of the episodes on Directv when they aired on the CW, and it's just like, oh my god, with all the compression and everything. Like, why do I spend all this time making these look so good? Interesting. If, uh, you know, so what, if you watch it on Amazon. I think it's you know, it's, it's appreciably better. And as as a guy who you know grew up loving Star Trek and stuff, I mean, this is great because the, the and and elaborate on on the the. Uh, the the show the concept pitch for Pandora, but essentially this is kind of a space fleet academy. Yeah, it, it, it has that element. I mean, when I pitched the idea of it, it was very much the paper chase in space. It was the future. It was um you know sort of a sci fi academy premise. And you know the show has evolved in the second season. It's much more in space and with spaceships and you know um uh, you know a third season. If let's say theoretically the third season can be much more Starship Troopers. Um, Fun. and a little more of a conspiracy thriller, a little three days of the condor. It's going to be, we got some really cool stuff cooking for that. So, um, you know, each season we kind of reinvented a little bit. It's, you know, I know that that didn't work for space 1999. I think it works for us. We mix up the cast a little bit. Um, and, and have, you know, and I'm sure that'll be the case next season. There'll be some cast changes and some new cast and, you know, new storylines and stuff. But, uh, you know, we left it on a cliffhanger, uh, at the end of the second season. So uh, I will pick up from there, you know, theoretically. Theoretically, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned Space 1999. I know it's come up a lot on Trexperts, uh, Fred lot. Freiberger. Well, you can't help it because, again, um, showrunners, as you know, are very important to television series. And uh, certainly I imagine your oral history uh, research has kind of uncovered that with the various television shows you've, you've uh, examined. And, you know, again, Fred Freiberger, the killer of uh, Star Trek Season 3, yeah. 10 years later, or around there, is kind of doing the same thing with Space 1999. And it's, uh, I, you know, um, I know that uh, 1999 has been streaming in a few places yeah. in the last few years. Uh, on over-the-air TV, uh, it just started running. MeTV just spawned a new channel called MeTV+. Plus. And locally, it runs at three in the morning Chicago time. Oh wow! <laughs> which kind of is perfect. It's kind of uh, perfect for night. So it's one a.m. your perfect. time, and uh, and it's man. I'll tell you, I've I've I'm, in small doses, I really do appreciate the first season of nineteen ninety nine. But uh, then you know, yeah, I, I do remember it being very clunky in the second season, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, they kind of leaned into their fry burger and. <laughs> Well, I, I remember we were doing our countdown of 100 greatest sci-fi episodes of all time for Trexpert. So I went back and looked at a lot of Space 1999 on the Blu-ray set, which is great from Shelf Factory. Yes. And, uh, you know, the first thing I remember as a kid was loving Bringers of Wonder, the two-part episode at the end of the second season. And I watched it. I'm like, what was I thinking? This is terrible. But then I went back and watched a lot of first season, and there's some terrific episodes of Space 1999. You know, it's very deliberately paced, but there's some very thoughtful and cool. And, we, you know, we talk about on the show, you know, because – it's so wrapped up in Star Trek and particularly our nostalgia for Star Trek because those of us who grew up at a certain time watching Star Trek in syndication, we remember when Space 1999 premiered and it was going to be the new Star Trek. In a that's sense. right. It's like that's how they were selling it. And it was something new. And we'd already watched the repeats of Star Trek so many times. So this is going to be something new and exciting. And, you know, I think we all were like, we wanted to like it so much. And, uh, you know, and it was sometimes very hard to like, and so there's just so much nostalgia for it um, that is, you know, it's interesting. And then you know, you go back and look at it now, and you realize that there's a lot of stuff it did very well. And I think, um, you know, the production design, the music, yes, some of the performances. Yes. So uh, you know, once you get past the premise of the moon traveling through solar <laughs> systems, sublight velocities, and you know, it, it's it's cool. I mean, I. I couple of people in Space 99 and I wanted to cast in Pandora for guest stars and it didn't work out but I'm I'm hoping to do that at some point you know Nick Tate I I've always liked Catherine that's Charles, great I always liked you know yeah that's you see and I love that you're doing that with Pandora and you are kind of wow. in, a, in a quiet way you know stunt casting but really to like help these people out, cast, like, the 12 people appreciate it. like when I cast yeah. Aaron and you know Aaron, Aaron was so sweet because she said you know, look, I always wanted to be a captain, and um, the show I finally got to be a captain. It was like great, and that sort of inspired me to want to cast more. I mean, we had in the spy episode Miriam Diabo, you know, from Living Daylights, and like that was, you know, it, it, she was great. And we, you know, it, it was so great getting to sort of know her 
because Ed had interviewed her for Nobody Does It Better. I so I didn't really know her, and she was you know super sweet. And wow. originally we had wanted to cast that was the episode we were going to cast George Lazenby and Catherine Schell. It was going to be on a Majesty's Secret Service reunion, and George Lazenby all of a sudden wanted all this money, mm. which we didn't have, and so we couldn't cast him. And then when we couldn't get George, we wanted to keep Catherine for something else because the whole idea was. You know, that would have been on our Madison Secret Service 50th reunion kind of thing. Sure. So. Oh, well. No, but again, it's great. And also, hey, I, as I've learned, um, I had to join uh, SAG. And it suddenly clicked in. And it might have even been through either conversations on your show or a show like Gilbert Gottfried. When, you know, as a kid, or I mean, I'm a big old Hollywood fan. I'm sure you are, too. Not only our sweet spot of when we grew up. But really, I mean, uh, the whole history of Hollywood, and I'm I'm yeah, guess, fascinated by every decade. But I'm like, why are these great stars of the 40s and 50s showing up in these monster movies or weird things or crap? And it's well, it's to maintain their in, their health insurance in a lot of ways. I, I look, and, absolutely. I mean, you look at all the um, yeah, you know, the Irwin Allen movies of the 70s and the airport movies, and you, you think about like Ava Gardner and Burt Lancaster and all these, I mean, legendary stars that are doing the schlock. And I mean, it, it, it's amazing. I mean, I remember this was great. I was talking to Barbara Carrera for uh, the the Bond book about Never Say Never Again, and we were talking about she did this movie, uh, in, uh, Irwin Allen movie called um, uh, The Day the Earth Ended, uh, and it, they ended up changing. So they they wanted a different title, and uh, it was William Holden and Paul Newman and um, Burgess Meredith, like this amazing cast. So she said the best thing about it was they shoot in the South Pacific. And every night, Paul Newman would cook dinner for them at his Wow. Concert. So she says, they're sitting around trying to come up with a new title for the movie. And William Holden says, I got it. The day our careers ended. <laughs> <laughs> and I just was, love that. Was that when time ran out? Or, time uh, ran out. That's right. It's when time ran out. And, is it, and isn't that the one where uh, Burgess Meredith is a former <laughs> circus acrobat <laughs> and he's got to walk the tightrope <laughs> across the volcano? <laughs> Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I, it's just I love that stuff. It's like when we're talking to Joe D'Agosta this week on Inglorious Trexperts. It's like, yeah, we talked about Star Trek, but I mean, we talked about the Lieutenant for twenty minutes. We ended up talking about the Year Living Dangerously for twenty minutes, and we talked about Pretty Maids all in a row for like a half hour. Well, I and, can't wait. Go and, on. And about Irwin Allen, and the story he tells about Irwin Allen is amazing, and that and that's the thing. It's like I use Star Trek to to draw people in, but then. You know, we talk about you know all the whole thing, all Hollywood, not just you know, not just Star Trek. And you know, these people they're they're old, they're gonna you know, and it's like we got to preserve their stories, you know. And there's a whole generation that doesn't care about anything pre TikTok, so it's like it's so important. I you know, Mark, I completely agree, and I keep saying pre '90s, and that's great that in fact a lot of your geek movie sweet spot is the '80s decade. But pre nineties, after the nineties, literally every fart has been recorded. Yeah. Whether right. it's whether it's yeah. family videos or po politics or entertainment, everything's documented, and that means really the twentieth century is the one where there are little gaps here and there. And some of the best stories, as evidenced by you talking to the casting guy and stuff, they're from the below the line people as far as film production. Oh. And in fact, I, I got to talk a couple of years ago with uh, uh, Don Nunley. Who was the prop master for uh, Le Mans, the uh, the Steve mm -hmm. McQueen racing movie, yeah. and then he also did a handful of other movies and a ton of the westerns from the early '60s. And just like you said, our our introduction was talking about the McQueen movie, but I'm like, you you did bridge uh, bridge over Ramagan, this mm -hmm. David Walper film from the late '60s with George Siegel and Robert Vaughn, and a, a, a classic kind of World War II '60s soldier yeah. movie that was shot in uh, Czechoslovakia during the revolution in Czechoslovakia when the Soviets came in and Dudik, the prime minister, was kind of beaten down and forced out because he was getting a little too uh, Western for the Soviet taste and, and getting a little free with uh, freedoms for its citizens. Yeah, the whole Prague and, Spring, yeah. Yes. And so, yeah, tell me about that. And it was great. And he had an amazing story. So, no, I hear what you're saying. And, and you're right. These people, we got to talk to them before uh, they go away. Because yeah. they do. They're the ones that have the fun stories. We missed a bunch. And the, you know, the problem with the actors is the actors are always on. And I always say that the Star Trek actors, they, they don't actually remember what happened. They remember the stories they told at the conventions. 
So it's like a game of telephone. They just keep repeating the stories from the commander and then they see what gets a laugh and then that's what they stick with. And so the stories they tell have no basis in reality anymore. You know, they're all just for entertainment purposes only, right? And and so it really is the below the line people, you know, who have a much more um, a realistic perspective on what actually happened. You know, I, I always say, you know, say, oh, why don't you talk to the actors more? They're the least interesting people to talk to when you want to get like real information about something because they want to just entertain you, you know, and if it's not a flattering story, they don't want to tell you. Going to uh, press junkets at San Diego and New York. I've been doing word balloon for 16 years Jeez. and, and, and initially, yeah, back in 2005, that's when I started. And, um, uh, you know, and I, and primarily comics, but again, you're at, you're at New York, you're at San Diego and especially early on, do you want to be on the press junket? to talk to the stars of X series. Sure. And just like you said, they only have so much information. And I always say uh, beyond the, when we say below the line for people who don't know the term, we're talking about the production designer, you know, maybe the assistant costume director, design. Yeah. costume design. Yes. I mean, and they do. Oh, I got it. <laughs> do you, do you watch on Cinemax, Mike judges tales from the tour bus show? Are you aware oh, of this? No, show? I don't have Cinemax anymore. I don't, you know, I, so many of those uh, premium stations. Of well, he he's dealing with the music business, and he literally does talk to the customers, the makeup people, the tour the tour bus driver. And the first season is all about country music. The second season was about hip hop, mm. and there are these incredible tales from the road kind of stories about a lot of you know guys and women that you know didn't mind sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but from country and R and B standpoints amazing stories and yeah i always uh, after learning on with the press junkets and stuff like you said it's like i'm i really focus with the writers the showrunners i want to talk to ashley about uh dota the dragon's blood uh cartoon yeah, which is doing on, great on netflix and uh you know he'd been working on that for a long time and and uh, for a long time couldn't talk about it uh, as you know from listening to the podcast but um it's doing so well and he had such a great experience doing the show i mean he really uh and it's so gratifying to see how successful it's been for him. Totally agree, man. No, it's 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 very, very cool. And again, the guy, you know, had his moments about writing Thor and writing X-Men First Class, as he has. Yeah, one day he'll write something people see. <laughs> and uh, no, I and uh, talking to Rob, too, uh, Burnett, I've been able to, you know, kind of uh, through yeah, him. Uh, such like, a great niche for himself as a commentator and, uh, you know, with his uh, YouTube videos and everything. Yeah. I'm happy for him. No question. No, it's it's really been fun, and uh, I'm very happy for him, and then happy for you, Mark. Because honestly, when I saw Free Enterprise, you know, uh, thirty years or twenty twenty two years ago, it was a great experience. I love that movie, and I uh, I saw it in the theater. Um, you know, right for Weigel, it's so weird. And, and again, talking to Rob, I had no idea uh, the back. I mean, I was excited because it was a movie about Star Trek, so you had me at a low. But uh, I, to really learn that kind of the Chicago critics were kind of shitty to Rafer because of his dad, Tim. And I mean, again, I've been in, I've been in Chicago broadcasting for over 30 years. So, you know, certainly knew uh, Tim and was friendly with them. Wasn't paying attention to the critics. I didn't, I didn't care. I wanted to see this movie and yeah, I just thought, you know, it's your free enterprises, big bang 30, 10 years earlier, basically. One of the heartbreaking things about that Chicago hating Rafer thing was Siskel and Ebert. Uh, Gene Siskel was, knew the family really well, I guess. And, you know, yeah. Ebert and Siskel didn't get along. And um, so they, they, you know, when, when it came out in Chicago, they didn't want to review it because of the Weigels. And, wow. you know, I grew up on Siskel and Ebert ever since it was sneak previews. And that would have been a dream, you know, to have those guys. And it could have really helped the movie too. And it was a whole political thing because of the, Tim Weigel that they didn't want to, um, review the show on Siskel and Ebert, you know, and yeah. that sucked. I mean, that was really yeah. disappointing. Um, but, you know, look, A Free Enterprise to me is, you know, it's the first film I, I, I made, had theatrically released, and uh, it was an incredible experience, you know, working with Shatner. You know, your, your, your first movie is always special, but this was really amazing because it was tied up in all this other, my love for Star Trek, my love for Bill Shatner, um, you know, and it was a very special film. And, you know, it's very frustrating for Rob and I both that, you know, it's not out on Blu-ray. There are various reasons for that. And, you know, uh, I hope that that will happen at some point. Um, but, you know, we don't own the film. We don't control the film. And the people that do, you know, make decisions that I can't explain. 
So um, uh, hopefully, you know, that'll happen at some point because there's a whole generation of people that don't know the movie, but I think, you know, there are people that know it very, very well and they love it. And it's always really nice because when I'm at conventions, people always come up and, you know, have something to say about the film. And, you know, you get those same stories to Star Trek people. Like this film changed my life. It inspired me to get out of my parents' basement, you know, and see the world, do this, kiss a girl, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, also, you know, some guy who was having just real issues with his family and, you know, really dep depression. And he watched the movie and it changed his life. I'm just like, you know, you, it's very easy for someone like me to be cynical about that. And, you know, I hear that and it's like, it's, it really means a lot, you know, it has sure. a lot of resonance. Um, and I'm so glad that that, you know, has that kind of impact. But for me personally, you know, it, it, it started off my career as a writer and producer and, and uh, you know, I learned a lot on it. And, you know, I mean, I treasure those moments you know, on set with Chatner, um, who is, you know, really a delight. And then the whole process of selling it, you know, it was a whole year where Rob and I were traveling the world where we were in like the camp, camp film festival with it, with Bill Shatner. I always joke, he took the Concord and we took like steerage. We were like, you know, coach on Delta, you know, sub coach on the wing somewhere. And, you know, Bill's like, oh, you know, and then he's at the, you know, the hotel, the cap, you know, and we were in some shithole and I, I don't deal well with shitholes. So I like called the publicist and I said, I don't care if I have to pay for it. Find me a nice hotel. I'm not staying at here. And, uh, and then, you know, Bill ended up giving his, um, you know, the bomber jacket he wore in the movie to Planet Hollywood Can, And we're at this huge press conference. And it's amazing. I mean, it was remarkable. And I always tell the story, but it blows my mind. You know, the the, the, really, the distributor did a party um, for, uh, along with the people doing Festival Can, which starred um, uh, Maximilian Schell. So Shatner shows up at the party. Maximilian Schell, they haven't seen each other since they made Judgment in Nuremberg. This is a party for our movie. And they're reunited. And and Rob and I are laughing because, of course, to us, it was Captain Kirk meets Dr. Hans Reinhardt of the Cygnus from the Black Hall. So we just thought it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> you know, that's uh, awesome. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, I'm just like, well, that's the way to start your career. So the movie wasn't a huge hit. You know, it's a cult film. You know, we didn't make a ton of money off of it. It doesn't matter because it's like memories like that are priceless. I hear you. And also, um, you know, uh, all all of the armchair filmmakers will laugh at uh, Ed Wood, and I love when Dana Gould shoots back with, uh, "He got like four movies made. How many movies did you get made?" <laughs> and it's true. I mean, and that's and or you know, um, Dave Gibbons, the co-creator of Watchmen. Uh, you know, obviously Alan Moore is beside himself that the rights didn't go back to them, and and I completely appreciate that. But by the same token, I've gotten to be friendly enough with Dave over the years, where I'm like Dave. The one thing that nobody can take away from you, and he already knew this, but I had to remind the audience. I'm like, you're Dave Gibbons, co-creator of Watchmen. Yeah. You can walk into any meeting, and people will take meetings with you because of the success of Watchmen. And yes, it's a shame that from a right standpoint, you guys didn't get what you were promised, but nobody was expecting Moby Dick, and you co-created Moby Dick. Yeah, And that's got to be great. And no, he's I, like, you're I, right. I, you know. Enterprise, you know, we, we got, for the most part, rave reviews, except in Chicago. You know, we won a ton of awards on the festival circuit, you know, um, so it really helped, uh, you know, our profile in t around town. And, uh, you know, and we got to travel the world. I mean, I hadn't really traveled outside the U.S. much and you know, got to go to Spain and got to go to France and got to go, you know, all these amazing places. So I'm so grateful, you know, for that whole experience and, and become friends with Shatner, you know. So, um, you know, all, you know, it was a win win. You know, I, I, I never, you know. And I just, like I said, I wish now there was a good version of the film for posterity. And I'm sure that'll happen one day, but um, uh, it's just, it's frustrating that it hasn't happened yet. I know, you know, Rob feels the same way, I, I'm sure. Well, and I know too that there is a version that people can watch on Amazon Prime, right? Or there was, no, I don't no, know if it's still there. Was, that shouldn't have happened. I don't know why that happened. And that was like a TV version, 4.3. There's not a good high def version. And I don't okay. know how it happened, but it's been rectified and it's not uh, not not there. So there's really no way. Oh, to they watch pulled it. it away. Oh, yeah. okay. The only, wow. the only way to watch it is if you can get it the the old DVD on um, Anchor on, Bay called on. Uh, <laughs> was it Anchor DVD was, on? Uh, was it Anchor Bay? Uh, yeah, the, the wonderful Anchor Bay DVD you can get on Amazon, but you know it's out of print. So, but that's the way to watch it. You know, that's the unfortunately yeah. it's the best way to watch it for the time being. 
you know. I understand. And no, I, you know, and when Rob told me, I, I went out and grabbed a, grabbed a copy. So I understand. Uh, definitely. Let best me ask you. Version I have. I don't even have a high tech version. I don't have any. I have best version I have is a DVD. So. Yeah. No, I understand. I want to ask you about Shatner. And again, I don't know how much you can answer this question, but um, I, I, you know, your, your Trexpert shows are always very positive. I haven't listened to the commentary with Jesse and uh, if, if also was it Eli, the other uh, uh, discovery, oh, discovery, right? The one they did on discovery. Yeah. Yeah. But it does seem to me, I mean, and, and in fact, you know, they, they started doing Star Trek day either last year or two years ago or whatever. And it really does feel like the current uh, wards of Star Trek. Uh, there's just something weird with uh, them and Shatner. And I also know that m much like your experience with George Lazenby, I know in the case of back when Enterprise was on the air, right. they were toying with the idea of having Shatner on. You guys cover it in, in your 50-year mission book. But it just really does seem like they're minimizing the importance of Shatner. And they made this great poster of all these different faces for this Star Trek day thing. And, you know, big shot of Nimoy, big shot of uh, Sunita Martin green. Fine. Nice shot of Sulu. And there's a little kind of the size of a dollar bill kind of head of Bill Shatner kind of in the background. And it's like, folks, there wouldn't be this celebration. And I know you feel this way. But like, can you explain? Because it does really feel like they 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 almost purposely kind of file Shatner in the middle of the stack, rather than be like, you know, come on, man, this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Shatner being the star of the show. Yeah, all, all I'll say about that is, if there were a Mount Rushmore for Star Trek, the head would be it would be Shatner, Leonard, Gene. Patrick and Avery. That's Mount Rushmore, right? Yeah. That's Mount yeah. Rushmore. You know, and so uh, I, I, if, if your show, if your, if your franchise exists on the back of Bill Shatner, you should respect that and you should honor that. You know, um, and, yeah. uh, I think anything less, and again, you know, I can't understand certain decisions made by marketing people or, you know, trying to um, target a certain demographic or, or to um, market in a certain way, but it's disrespectful uh, not only to Bill, but to everyone who, you know, grew, grew up on, on Star Trek and, and loves Star Trek and cherishes that character. Um, you know, look, L Leonard is um, a singular talent, but as we know from watching The Cage, we would not be watching Star Trek 55 years later without Bill Shatner. Yeah. How great Leonard was, which he was. I completely agree. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't understand it because again, the other uh, reality is at 91 or 90, I forget how old Bill is, but he's got more days uh, uh, behind him than ahead of him. And we certainly no, wish no well. He's going to live to be 200. I would I love that. The guy. He looks 50. I know. No, God damn, you're right, man. I mean, literally, <laughs> uh, for the for the fiftieth anniversary at Comic Con when they had that exclusive press panel, I'm assuming you were there, probably. But uh, they had, uh, you know, this was when Fuller was still attached to Discovery, and they had this great all star panel of it was Shatner and it was um, Scott Bakula and Mike Dorn and and Brett Spiner and uh, Jerry Ryan. Uh, it was it was terrific. And, uh, I mean, you're right. I mean, the guy is just ridiculously spry for 90 and so alert. And he's got a reason to get up in the morning. And I, I, I say that to my friends who have older parents and relatives and stuff. And it's like, as long as I got something to do, you know, that's going to keep him sharp. And well, here he is, you know. Forward, never backwards. He's always involved whatever the new hot thing is, you know, new technology, yeah. um, you know, always working, always traveling. Um He's, a, he's an extraordinary guy, you know, and the success of that character is in large part due to what he brought to it. You know, they, you know, people talk about, you know, how big the performance is. I like to think of his operatic, you know, um, he is, um, you know, he, he, he's just a really extraordinary guy and, um, and brought so much to that character, you know, uh, just in terms of, uh, uh, you know, being a leader you want to follow, um, commanding the respect of his crew. You know, and being a uh, you know a captain with a green girl on every planet, as we say, yeah, he's, he's, uh, 
he, he and, and just he's 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 remarkable, and I don't think even he understands the appeal of Star Trek or that character. But um, I think it befuddles him. But uh, that's okay. He doesn't need to. He just uh, are but, there uh, when you're done, and obviously you finish the the Star Wars oral history book. Are there other TV shows or movie franchises you'd like to Well, get? I guess it's been announced, so I don't have to be uh, circumspect about it. The next book we're doing is sort of a history of the action movie spotlighting um, uh, John Wick. It's really a John Wick uh, gun fu kind of, but it goes to deep dive into the new age of action. So it's a little different, but it, it, the difference with this book is every book we pitched, this, our editor came to us and asked if we were interested. And I'm a fan, and Ed's a fan, and um, we decided to do it and uh I, it's actually turning out quite well i mean the manuscripts due in august and we're, we're almost done and got great great interviews and great stories and i'm actually really much more excited about that book than i thought i would be would you really would well. you ever would you ever want to turn the audios into an audio product the audio interviews you might well, i mean they, they do the um audible does the uh the audio podcast so you know that's pretty much is I it, it, it audio books so it, but are the like for instance in the 50-year mission i'm assuming that's just narrating the book or are there inserts of the people you're talking to no, it's all narrating. It's all narrating. that's what i thought yeah well and that's why i wonder if uh and again you know radio guys so i'm always thinking about uh, you know the the those those interviews and stuff must be amazing and would you ever want to do and not, you know, uh, not really too much work. And, um, okay. But, you know, that's part of what the pod, you know, tr you know, Trexperts is. And, you know, honestly with Trexperts, you know, people are just, do you edit them? I'm like, no, it's live on tape. You know, it's, it's, uh, I don't believe in editing. It's like, I, it's, I'm so I, with you. You know, I, look, for something I do for free, you know, where I'm not looking to make money on it, I'm not doing any more work than I have to, because, you know, the podcast we do for fun or, you know, or, and a preservation of the stories, you know, for the, like I say, the love of the game. But, you know, I'm not making money on those podcasts, nor do I try. You know, we don't do Patreon. We don't do, um, uh, you know, uh, we don't do Apple subscriptions. We don't sell advertising because, you know, we want as many people to listen to them as we can. And thankfully, we don't need to. But um, I don't, uh, you know, so I don't like, you know, I, I don't really look to do things that are, that are you know, are at, at a loss, as they say. No, I understand, and it is time-consuming, so I can appreciate that. And by the way, I'm the same way. I And especially coming from broadcast radio, I let people swear. I don't mind if it sounds messy. Yeah. I, I didn't mind that heat of the moment play for a second just when we were talking. I mean, that's that's fun. I think that's fun, and it's it's all right. No, um, I, I, I think it's I, – I like the, the, the down and dirtiness of it all. And, you know, if somebody's like, oh, I messed that up, can I say that again? It's like, I don't care. It's like, you know, yeah. it's like, I like live on tape because to me it's kind of like a talk show. You know? 100%. No, exactly. It is a talk show. It's a good panel. You guys do a great panel show. And uh, I've had Brian Weiss on my uh, show a few times to talk about Toys That Made Us and yeah. Toy Store Near You. And I'm always happy to talk to him. And then, of course, you know, the PR people have him stacked with a bunch of other interviews because I'm like, I really want to talk Star Trek with you at some point. He's like, "Oh yeah, man, we will. It's cool." And uh, and he's he's incredibly kind, and I'm always glad he's they a huge, back. huge Star Trek geek. In fact, so he's doing um, <laughs> the center seat for History Channel, which comes out this fall, which I'm somewhat involved with. I, I Great, the consultant giving them advice. Uh, I have, you know, I'm not really involved with the day to day, and I did a lot of commentary for them. But uh, I think it's gonna be great. I mean, I know they talk to a lot of people, and it's gonna be multi part. A deep dive into Star Trek, so I'm excited to see it. Um, and you know, uh, like I said, Brian is a super fan, so um, it, you know, it should be really good. I know that this is something he's been wanting to do for a long time. I also like the pacing of his documentaries and television shows, and especially like just Toys That Made Us, it's hilarious to watch yeah, because and, and from passion, you know, it's not like somebody said, Oh, what can we cash in on? Oh, toys are hot. Let's do that. No, he is like a huge toy collector and loves toys. And basically, you know, because of his success, you know, managing and all these comedy shows and selling all these comedy shows and managing all these giant comedians, he's able to force people to take shit that they wouldn't take otherwise. So like that is something where like I want to do a toy show and nobody wants to do it. And then he 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 sells it to them and it's a tremendous success. It's like, oh, see, you know, so. Well, and others have tried to do toy shows. Uh, you know, you had things, and and again, no disrespect to Toy Hunter and things like that, but like Brian, like manages to convey the fun 
without making fun of it or yes. coming off. And, and again, I don't know, man. I mean, you and I are obviously nerds and we love this shit. So it doesn't feel geeky to me. And also to me, I worked at, I worked at uh, the CBS news station in Chicago for several years and in recent years. And it was so great just in the newsroom, literally uh, producers and writers going, Hey, you're into that nerd shit. Have you seen the toys that made us? That's huh. a fucking hilarious show. And huh. I'm like, yeah, it is. Or, and then the movies that made us dragged them in even more. And it's like, they're funny. They're really, and they're interesting, and they get these interesting stories. God, who knew the toy business was as cutthroat as it is and as it's exploited in the toys that made us? Yeah, the no. Barbie episode, it's like, wow. You know, I, who knew? That's really underserved. And, you know, there hasn't been these great deep dives into the toy world. And so yeah. it's great that he's doing that and uh, exploring that in a way that people haven't in the past. Yeah, I agree, man. And, and again, like you said, his comedy side as well. I, I, especially during COVID, I'm like, God, how are you making specials? You know, when nobody's performing stand up and stuff, and no, and also uh, him uh, getting control of the uh, the Bill Hicks uh, material, right? And, you know, and and again, I, again, we're the same age or close enough that yeah, goddamn. I mean, I, I love Bill Hicks, and when I heard about that and saw the documentaries he made, I'm like, this is fantastic stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of reasons to talk to Brian, and I'm really glad okay. that. Uh, that he he found uh, his way onto Trexperts. There's uh, I'm not, when we're done recording, I'll I'll, uh, I'll give you a recommendation if you don't know somebody. I'll wait till we're off the air though. I don't want to I don't want to <laughs> obligate you. Yeah, but, you know it's funny. It's like sometimes I get these you know fans who are pitching themselves, and I'm like, that's just not our show. There are no. plenty of podcasts like that. No, like, this is an industry. Know. This is an industry pro that I think you'd really like to have yeah, on and stuff. That's at least great. that's great. So I mean, we really are just interested in people who are knowledgeable and interesting and have a good story to tell. Yeah. Don't, don't worry. I'm not like, hey, I'd be great on your show. No, no, no. I got my <laughs> show. I'm all right, man. It's a lot of those, and it's kind of like, no, uh, no, no. Don't worry, man. I mean, uh, I'm like, so many Star Trek podcasts. So it's like, well, that's you know. that's the other great thing, man, is there are so many Star Trek podcasts, and um, you have found, again, a, a niche within a niche that makes your show unique. You guys are all really passionate about it and, and very knowledgeable. And again, God, even we haven't. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the fact uh, your your magazine writing of the '90s uh, remind me. I remind you feel old. Please, again, you're old. I'm older than you. Relax. It's all <laughs> it's all good. But no, you. Uh, what was the name of the magazine in the '90s? Sci-fi Universe. Man. Sci-Fi Universe. Absolutely, man. Jesus, that was a great magazine. I get, you know, it's so funny. I can't get over how many people say that to me. You know, I just did this week. Someone was doing something on the documentary, on the, the 1982 documentary. It was, and, and they said, oh, you know, I've been such a fan even since I was a kid reading sci-fi universe. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you're killing me. I'm with you, man. I no, I know. Sci-fi universe. But, uh, you know, look, we were the internet before there was an internet because we were sarcastic. We were the magazine for sci-fi fans of the life. I would never do a magazine like that now because the internet is all about negativity, right? We were the only ones who were, we would do 50 reasons why Return of the Jedi sucks. With, because everything else was kumbaya, right? Now that everything's negative, I would only go positive. That's part of Trexpert's why we don't talk about the things we don't like. We only like to talk about the things we like or the things like Star Trek Three, where we, we, um, we, we're teasingly negative, where we really <laughs> like it, but we have a lot of negative things to say. So it's like, um, you know, because the world has gotten so cynical and negative, we don't go there. We go very positive, you know? But I do. Time, Sci-Fi Universe was like, we were the infant terrible of the genre. I mean, we were, we were trying to be Spy Magazine. Right, exactly. And I loved Spy Magazine. Very good comparison. No question about that. And uh, no, I get it, man. You know, uh, it's funny. I know you guys tease Star Trek III. Uh, Lawrence Luckinbill, Cybok, of course, uh, recently. I don't know if this is. I love that. You say that to me. Lawrence Luckinbill. You know, he plays Cybok. Well, you know, I'm, saying for, I'm saying for the audience, of course. <laughs> I know. No, no, no. I know. Exactly. I don't know if you know about this space time thing, Professor Einstein. Let me let me break it down for you. <laughs> but um, he he wrote a graphic novel based on one of his one man plays because he did uh, oh, one man LBJ. plays. Did he do LBJ? He did LBJ, but this one was about um, Teddy Roosevelt. Oh wow! And it came out right uh, right around the time of uh, the inauguration, and um, and it was great. And I so I got to interview him. Could not have been sweeter. Yeah. And and you know again. It's funny. I love Star Trek three, but of course we all Star Trek five. It's like, 
All right, but to me, there's still fun scenes, and I've heard you guys we defended Star Trek. We did two pa- we did a WonderCon panel on it where we, we had uh, David Lowry, you know, who wrote it, and 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 we were, you know we defended Star Trek. But we've done a couple of things, and even when we we're talking to Ralph Winter, we we defended it. So, um, you know, look, Star Trek Five looks better and better as the years go on compared to other things, and. Um, not only that, you know, char- the heart of it is character, and yeah. it, it unfortunately gets a bad rap because of the effects. People yes. can't get past the effects. I can't get past the effects. I'm you with know, you. Yeah, you know that it was condemned to to fail because of that awful decision to go with Brent Fern. If it had been ILM effects, no one would be talking about Star Trek Five the way it may not be their favorite movie, but it wouldn't be this bastard stepchild that everyone loves to rag on. It's just because those effects make it easy to hate. I, I hear you, man. Well, thankfully, watching it over and over again, I found more and more that I like about it. And I was really able to have a – because I'm the same way, man. When, when you, and I'm sure you feel this way, and including yourself. If, if I wanted to be negative, I would not have you on as a guest because I would be like, hey, you know what sucks about whatever, you know, free enterprise? Or, and again, clearly I've shown my Nothing. love for it. But it's like, right, there's a, exactly. But no, you're a guest, and the operative word is guest. You don't invite somebody into your living room yeah. to tell them why they suck. Yeah. And, and it was very easy with Lucky Bill because, thankfully, his career was so interesting. We talked about Boys in the Band and uh, other TV that he did. And uh, ultimately, and he had great Star Trek Five stories. And it would be, God, I'd almost recommend that you guys try to get him yeah, on I the phone. Yeah, I thought about that. That's a good idea. You, you know? know? And, and, you know, he's good in the movie. I mean, you know, look, had it been Sean Connery? Of course. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, he's good in the movie. He is good in the movie. Yeah. And, he's, and he's a great counterweight to their to the, the trio's characters. Yeah, and he was so sweet about it. And then really, he's like, oh, I'm so glad you feel that way, John. And then we had an amazing conversation. Everyone and, uh, has secret pain. Well, exactly. <laughs> we go stronger through the sharing. That's right. I need my pain. I don't want to lose my pain. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's great, right? Come on. Yes. That's great stuff. And the opening teaser, you know, when he with, with the laughing Vulcan yes. and the way Shatner shoots it like Lawrence of Arabia. It's all great. This, this, I mean, what does God need with the starship? Come on. This is awesome stuff. George Murdoch. Come on, man. Yeah, guys, George Murdoch is God. I mean, I, I love it. Inspector Scanlon. It's, love. It's, it's, you know, lots of love in that movie. I, I it's just see, that I, anniversary I, yesterday, I think. I, I would vote mentioning George Murdoch. I would vote for a Barney Miller uh, retrospective. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I always year. remember George Murdoch is the doctor, Doctor Salik from uh, the original Battlestar Galactic. Absolutely, you absolutely. And, and then, of course, he's the the admiral in the Best of Both Worlds. Yeah. Now, do you, that line where he says about Shelby, uh, you know, only a, an old man's fantasies. It's like, oh, come on, it's so ninety. <laughs> Even then, that was like, I yeah. You know the one that the one that um, confuses me is, and I've heard younger generations pick a part part on next generation movie or episode. It's the host, and and I've heard younger people like kind of make a face at that one. And I guess in today's oh, because uh, he rejects uh, him because he's now a woman. Look, here's the thing about that: it was the freaking nineties. You can't apply today's standards. To the way things were then, we've come so far since then. That was actually a very provocative thing at the time, and you have to try and understand it. And you know what? Maybe she's not attracted to women. She's allowed. I know? agree. I agree. Yeah. And again, yeah. I, I, God, uh, there's a great uh, movie podcast, uh, Projection Booth, and my friend Gabe Hardman recommended it to me. And they were talking about Better Off Dead, the Savage Steve Holland right. movie, yeah. with John he- John Cusack. And for people listening who don't know. John Cusack's character is so obsessed with his girlfriend she br- that there are photos all over the walls. His hangers are in large photographs of her. So, and and you know, there were it was two guys around our age that loved the movie, and a third person that was younger. And her point was, "Wow, that looks like a stalker." And uh, <laughs> you know, John Cusack's trying to kill himself throughout the movie. Suicide's not funny, and it's like it's a parody, and it's and it's such an extreme parody. You can't right. take it seriously, but again, different point of view, different generation. Here yeah, we are. But you know, it's like, uh, I, you know, I, look, it gets us into territory that. that oh, know, I know. It's a real source of uh, of uh, consternation for me. You know, when people start to, you know, get upset about old movies, it's like, 
you you're 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 well you know i, I think it's going to happen when no time to die premieres we're going to get into that whole you know the, the the problematic nature of the bond movies and it's just like then don't watch them well if that's ended by the bond's behavior don't watch he's not modeling good behavior he's a damaged guy who drowns his sorrows in women and booze and you know what it's realistic and it, and it's also you know uh, yeah, you can say, oh, it should be aspirational for men. That's fine. You can say, but you know what? I'm not interested in like this is problematic. I, I, you know, the Bond movie should have some kind of warning or something. It's like, don't watch it. But that's, watch it, I do think Bond, the Bond franchise is at an interesting crossroads. There was a milder version of this, as you know, during the Timothy Dalton years, yeah, where they did it, try to pull yeah. back on the character and make him a little more PC. It wasn't because of the sexism. They thought it was modeling bad behavior to have him smoke and to have him sleeping around during AIDS. Right. So, but you could even say that made him a less interesting character. So yes. uh, you, maybe they shouldn't have done that. I could pull, you know? Well, I feel that way. I, I, I mean, I, I was... Too. I'm not a huge Timothy Dalton fan. Although kids today, these kids today, love Timothy Dalton. It's, well, it's amazing. Next to Connery, apparently, everyone thinks Dalton was like this incredible Bond. And I, I don't dislike Dalton, but I don't hold him in this incredible esteem the way I do Connery and, and I, honestly, Roger and, and George and, and Daniel. I always say I'm like, I'm like Father Flanagan when it comes to James Bond. There's no such thing as a bad James Bond. Yeah, uh, I, it's, it's the movies. Did the movies serve the character or not? And I feel that way about Dalton. I do. I do see the appeal of Dalton, but unfortunately, he was underserved by two, not two that great movies. movies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, he hey, uh, third movie. Yep. Warren Drummond says hello. Storyboard artist. I see that. Artist. I know Warren. Uh, Warren's a great guy. He's super talented. Ama amazing uh, storyboard artist. Yep. Longtime friend and uh, longtime uh, viewer and listener. So, oh, that's I'm, great. I'm glad he's here. Chris Conley says if uh, Scott Mance is in. This movie, uh, he'll be watching. Is he? Oh, he's in 1982. He's a producer on it, and he'll be in it. So you should go to Kickstarter, 1982, greatest geek year ever, and uh, check out because there's some amazing rewards, and you'll make Scott very happy. Absolutely. Here, I'm going to bring more enthusiastic than either of us combined. <laughs> I mean, I love having Scott on in Glorious Trexperts and making fun of his enthusiasm. You know, because you know when he goes off on Star Trek 2009 or Metamorphosis, it's like. You know, you could power a wind farm off of his energy. I mean, hydroelectric power. <laughs> you just, you know, put him up to the grid, and Scott could power electricity in a small town. It's unbelievable. I'm glad you allow for a little bit of debate over things like the 2009 Abrams uh, Star Trek movie. And I know Mance is a big fan yeah, of that big, film. Big, big, big believer. Big believer. Yes. And you know what? That's great because my whole thing is. Everyone's entitled to love or like what they like, of and, you know. And and it's not very fun if we just all agree. Where's the debate? You know, no, I, fun. I, I, you know, all these people who like, like, oh, you know, you're you're gatekeeping or whatever to somebody who's like doesn't like what they like. No, you just have a difference of opinion. When when you tell them they're an idiot for liking it, well, that's that's you know. But but uh, but I think it's it's great when people have a difference of opinion particularly if they can articulate what it is they don't like or they do like about something. Well, you know? and, and I, that's what I always search for because I will confess new, new Star Trek disappoints me from a writing standpoint. That said, and I always mean this, I am there every uh, Friday morning with, or Thursday, what I guess it was on Thursdays, new, new Trek usually breaking on Thursdays. Whenever they drop a new episode, I'm always optimistic. Like, all right, well, maybe I'll like this story, this individual episode, and where the season is going. Maybe it'll wrap up or whatever. Um, and I and, and I am. I remain optimistic. I remain optimistic about Star Trek Prodigy. I have friends who wrote on Star Trek Prodigy, and I'm really hoping that I'll enjoy it more than a lot of the other new Trek. But again, I don't I don't blame anyone for liking it. But I do always want, as you said, it's like explain to me what you like about it. And and uh, and again, not to challenge them, but I really do. I'm like, all right, what do you, what is it about the show that you like? And some people, are, and sadly, a lot of times the answer I get is, I don't know, it's Star Trek, I like it. And it's like, all right, you know, again, I wish there was a deeper oh, answer. Modern Trekkie, it was this Star Trek they loved. I'll tell you, you know, it's interesting. You know, Voyager was a show that I didn't particularly like at the time, and I was very dismissive of it. And that was a show, and I talked about this when I was doing my research for the fifth year mission. Where I was talking to a lot of women of a certain age 
that grew up on Voyager. And I guess I was lost to me how meaningful that show was to them, seeing a woman as captain. Sure. And how much that um, – and, and, and uh, so, you know, I realized that I was kind of being overly dismissive of something that meant – a lot to people, and I and I got that because I got how, in a way, Shatner and Kirk was a huge role model for me growing up, and why having a female captain meant so much to these women who went into you know medicine and went into tech and all that stuff. So, um, uh, you know, so I was willing. I you know I sort of gave Voyager another chance. I still didn't love it, but I, I appreciated it more, and I understood where they were coming from. And I did find some episodes like Timeless and a couple other that are quite good that I really like. Um, I'm, I'm never on my list of great Star Trek series, but um, but I had a lot more appreciation for it, and uh, you know, so I get why certain things mean so much to people, and and you know why you kind of not tread carefully, but just people like what they like, and there are a lot of reasons, some good, some bad, and you know you just respect that, and uh, but you know I'll be merciless if somebody goes after TOS, you know, because it's like the whole thing is built on the shoulders, you know, we stand on the shoulders. Oh yeah, and it's like you know so certain people who are like you know dismissive of, of the original series it's like you know everything's a copy of that and it's a copy of a copy of a copy it, and, and it was so innovative so you don't have to like it you can think it's cheesy or over the top or you know whatever you can't understand it was made in the 60s it's so groundbreaking it's so ahead of its time and you know the format is something you know that that still is in the dna of every star trek show since so that that's the one thing i won't i won't tolerate <laughs> I'm, no, I'm with you on that. And Voyager, I, I agree. It, it felt like they ran out of ideas. But I will say, looking back, there are significant episodes, like you say, that at least ask an interesting science fiction question. Yeah. And I think that's what's missing in today's Star Trek. They they seem to have forgotten that they're a science fiction show. Well, we just and, had Brian Fuller on the Trek Sports Briefing Room, and he did commentary on Bride of Chaotica. And it's great. And it, it, I love that episode. And it's great hearing his perspective on it. And, you know, but even he's talking about why he felt at the time the show was very risk averse. And I agree with that. And I think, you know, after Deep Space Nine, where the show didn't perform the way they hoped and it was much more risky and off concept, you know, Voyager was created to be more safe. Absolutely. And, to be light. and you know, now people who aren't familiar with the history don't see that. They just evaluate it on its own terms and, and love it. And that's great. But you know, to me, it was always next generation light. Oh, one hundred percent. And again, even sadly, even more so in Enterprise, and even more heartbreaking when you hear what Braga and Rick Berman wanted to do with Enterprise and start the first year totally Earthbound, on Earth, right? Yeah, which would have been a lot more interesting and exciting to do in the same ways that Deep Space Nine well, was I mean, interesting. The problem of Star Trek in that era was it was so ratings driven, and, and you know, and and the bar was so high for the success of Next Generation. That they were always chasing that, and they were never going to catch. They were never going to be able to recapture that um, because of just the way it was distributed. The fact that they were on these, you know, these low-rated networks. Yeah, and, UPN. Yeah, and so it was never. It was never going to happen. And as a result, there was, you know, there was just a risk averseness that really damaged it because they were, you know, they weren't willing to take risks and try something new and really stay within this paradigm. And so, um, which isn't to say there aren't wonderful episodes of Enterprise. There are. Um, and you know it's it's really hard to do twenty six episode seasons, really hard. And it's amazing that there were as many good episodes as there were. Uh, Warren says uh, I once told producer writer Matt Nix to watch original Trek when he prepped The Gifted, as it had a perfect set of unique characters and conflicts and relationships. Sure, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. No, it's, no it, I original Star Trek is the template for character. Uh, uh, that Troy, that original Troika. You know, and everyone, you know, it's been said a million times. It's the id, the super ego, and, you know, and... and, and uh, but the ego. You know, the thing. Yeah. And it's, so it's brilliant. It's it's absolutely brilliant. No, I'm with you, man. Uh, real fast, as we wrap up, uh, comic book fan, what, what did you read, if you were? Well, I was a huge comic book fan in the late 70s and early 80s. And, um, you know, so I, I was mostly a moral person, but I read a lot of Batman because I just love Batman. And, you know, yeah. I was the kind of guy who would buy a bunch of stuff like when Electra died, because I figured when I sold them, they, they put me through college, you know? And, and but then I would buy stuff like ROM, the Space Knight, and Micronauts, which I just love. Sure. Uh, and was worth nothing. And, of course, the Star Trek comics <laughs> and, and the Battlestar Galactic. I bought all, I was a sucker for all those movie things, um, you know, like Beyond the Black Hole, the Charleston comic. And, well, uh, oh, that. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, I just, I, I love that stuff. This is, you know, movies that never had sequels and all that shit. You know, well, because it was the Logan's Run comic that Marvel did. I mean, the 2001 comic. I mean, it's like, come on. Oh yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but I loved all that. And, you know, Planet of the Apes and 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 uh, uh, and, and and so I, you know, I kind of at a point it, it was getting too expensive. Like right when I went to college, it was getting too expensive for me to to keep up with my habit. Yes. You know, my addiction. So sure. I sort of went cold turkey on comics for a while. But whenever something significant came out, like Killing Joke or you know Dark Knight uh, or um, Watchmen, I would buy those. So I was in you know aware of what was happening in the zeitgeist. Sure. Um, but but I, I you know I didn't I didn't keep really collecting. I'm so glad you had the Tiptons on Trexperts. Oh, they're great. Yeah, because yeah, man, I'll tell you that is the one thing is licensed uh, comics, whatever the subject. They get real fans to write this stuff now, unlike uh, Charlton in the 70s ah. when, you know, they might have been on model with their Hanna-Barbera comic books, but the stories just weren't that yeah. fun. I, and, uh, well, you look, one of my, my favorite experiences of, you know, was when I was doing the Deep Space Nine comic. Was, you know, I did a bunch of those from Malibu. I and, didn't know that. That's great, man. Oh, yeah, I did. Uh, I did, uh, you know, I, it was back when I was a journalist. I was interviewing the guys in Malibu and, uh, they say, well, you're so well versed in Star Trek. Would you be interested in, um, you know, doing comics? And I said, yeah. I've never written a comic. They said, it's not hard. We'll give you a script. And you know, if you, you know, and and I, I wrote. Uh, it was a similar thing. My first Deep Space Nine, I think, it was Deep Space Nine Eight, and it was too long. And I said, this really needs to be two parts. And they said, well, I, you know, I don't know. And then they read it and they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll make it two parts. Oh, that's it great. Sort of a thinly veiled Ian Frank story. And then I did Deep wow. Space Nine Zero, which was Terok Nor, which is my favorite. One of my favorite things I ever did it was basically the Fountainhead in space, and wow. not a non Rand fan, but it was it was great. And then I did a mini series for them called Hearts and Minds, and a sequel to that, Lightstorm. And then I did the McKee, and I was supposed to write the Voyager comic, but then they got sold to uh, Marvel. And then DC hired me to do a uh, classic Star Trek, which was really exciting. And the first time I got a check from DC, which that alone was like really because I remember going on school trips in like middle school to DC at that you know and 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 you know, just to see how cool it was. And I, I, because I remember, I, the thing I remember most about that school trip was going to the gift shop and buying the Superman 2 album on vinyl, which had the hologram of the Superman logo. And uh, so the fact that I was now getting a check from DC was very exciting to me. Um, so yeah, I had a great time doing comics. I did, And I was really always surprised that, um, it, you know, IDW never came and asked me to do anything. Because you know those were extremely well received and they they were great comics and I really enjoyed doing it and um, you know that's something that uh, you know pending availability and timing and everything I'd love to do that again that was that was really fun man I you know I, I bet IDW would would love to have you uh, do something um, Eric Williams wants to know if you have heard any word or <laughs> on a Blu-ray of the Motion Picture from Paramount anytime oh, soon nice man. thing perhaps to promote Paramount Plus well you know even if I did I couldn't say anything. But uh, I will say this, um, as Mr. Spock is fond of saying, there are always possibilities. Uh, I think is you know the, the thing that's always kept it from happening has been cost. And um, the great thing is now the home video division doesn't have to carry the load because of Paramount Plus. And given how the Snyder Cut worked and created amount of attention all disproportionate to what it was, um, that Star Trek is in a similar position where they could throw a little bit of money and get a lot of love and a lot of attention, you know, for doing something. So I, I suspect it will happen. Uh, I don't know when that timetable is, uh, but I think it's inevitable. And I also think that, you know, the home video division, one of their most successful Star Trek has always been among their most successful titles, you know, on home video. So the only way you can sell them again is to remaster in 4K, and I don't think you can put out a version of the motion picture without, uh, re you know, putting the money into the director's edition. That said, you know, I would hope and expect that any version of Star Trek the motion picture is like Blade Runner, where you, when Blade Runner came out with the theatrical version, the work print version, the final version. You know, I would want Star Trek the, the theatrical, the ABC cut, you know, and the director. Yes, version. yes. So I, I'm not interested in just one version of it. You know, um, I love the director's edition, but I also want the version that I grew up with. And I also, the ABC, because it has a bunch of crazy scenes that aren't in any other version. And, I, 
yeah. I, what was it with ABC, man? They did it, as you know, they did it with Superman, the, the Donner first Superman movie as well, and also we, Star we Trek did all, We did two episodes of Trek Spurts on this. Because it was so interesting when we talked about the um, TV cuts, you know, because that started in the in the seventies with stuff like King Kong, because they needed yeah. to cut two nights, right? And so they had to add a bunch of footage. So you know, Chow Factory just put out King Kong on Blu-ray with the NBC cut. You know, Star wow. Trek also put in a bunch of extra footage, and they didn't even really promote it. And Star Trek fans would have been like, "Wow, new footage!" and and that was partially you know Gene uh, wanting to restore some of this the footage. Um, and then you, um, you know, you have obviously the Superman cut. I was so happy a couple of years ago, Warner Archives put out the ABC cut of uh, Superman because all I had was a VHS tape that I right off ABC many, many years ago. Um, but yeah, I, I'm fascinated by TV cuts of movies. And we did two episodes on um, of that phenomenon on Trexperts. And one of the most fun episodes we've done with Eddie Egan, who was a publicist for Paramount at the time. And we also talked about a lot of the lost scenes like Sp Khan's baby. Have you gone into on the four thirty movie? Have you gone into um, those great seventies movie of the weeks that ABC was making? Because I saw Leonard Gold Goldsmith Goldberg. I forget his last name. Sorry, I don't mean to be rude. Huh. Uh, but uh, what is it? Leonard Goldberg. Is that is that his name? Yeah, he was the ABC a lot executive. Of documentaries. Yeah, and he's yeah. on those those tell. I mean, I'm sure you guys pour through those Television Academy oral histories that they've shot yeah. that are sitting on their website. Some of those are really good and some of them are not. Sure. Depending sure. On who the interviewer is. But that that era of the 70s, it really, I mean, they, you know, God, duel the the six million dollar man uh first three movies, the Night Stalker movies, you know, all those things were made. Uh I mean, and I know they were backdoor pilots in some cases. Duel wasn't, but right. there really were a lot of interesting Movies of the week, and I, I don't know if you know. the Night Stalker, obviously, sure. Um, yeah, so the many horror movies, a lot of great horror movies, and then a lot of great miniseries. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the Winds of War. I mean, oh yeah, yes, he really talked about that as much, but um, for sure, Shogun, yeah, so, from yeah, NBC, Mata, it's great. A lot of them, yeah. But I was just wondering if they, if you guys in that 4:30 movie, uh, concert, no, we haven't really done that. Although we've talked about it, we we really stick to movies. But we've been talking about maybe doing a TV movie week. There's this one that I love, like I used to do Columbo, called Murder by Natural Causes. But I'd have to see it again, um, you know, to talk about it with any degree sure. of expertise. But then we talked about, you know, Late the Heaven on Trexperts, which is an amazing PBS MLW. Fantastic. I and love that movie. It's so hard to get a hold of these days. Yes. DVD as well, never put out on Blu ray. And um, it's a, um, one of the great adaptations of a sci fi novel ever. I have talked about that with uh, Burnett. I, I completely agree. And He's again, remember seeing it on on you know over the air TV. My favorite what, that I pointed out to Brad Meltzer is uh, a big Houdini guy. Yeah. And uh, oh, that's funny. Of course, uh, mentioning Lath of Heaven, uh, Bruce Davidson. You damn right, Warren. So that's awesome. Um, but I uh, I was talking to Brad, and Brad had an episode of his Decoded Up uh, show on uh, Houdini. And I'm like, have you ever seen this movie of the week from the 70s where Paul Michael Glaser plays Houdini? Uh, Sally Struthers was best Houdini. And the narrator of the film was Dave best. Stroll. No, but it should have been. But uh, in, in classic, what the hell are they doing with this casting TV fashion? Uh, Vivian Vance as best. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's on YouTube. And, and Bill Bixby plays a medium that Houdini exposes and right. is integral to the part uh, to the plot as well, and it's it's hilarious. And I'm like, Brad, you got to watch this because I know he's a big Houdini. I'm like, it's it's ridiculous in the best way. And you know, two days later, he texts me. He's like, I'm pounding the floor laughing as I'm <laughs> so yeah. But again, that's I'm I'm uh, you know, and and much like yourself, uh, I backed into an Out of Limits podcast with my buddy Gabriel Hardman, another great storyboard artist that Warren I know knows quite well. And, you know, because Gabe was just like, how come no one's done the original series and done a really good podcast to then? I'm like, that's a great idea. Let's do that. So we're, we're closing in on finishing up season two. Great. And, oh, and awesome. we've, yeah, we've been discussing what we might do next. Because, again, there's a million Star Treks. There's a million Columbo yeah. podcasts. It's like, what's... <laughs> Is there a TJ Hooker podcast? There should be. 
That's fantastic. Oh, my God. Well, anyway, Mark, you've been very generous with your time. I don't want to keep you. Well, John, but... thanks so much for having me on the show. This is Oh, really my fun. God. It was my pleasure, truly. I hope you'll come back. Uh, the Kickstarter, again, here's the poster for what uh, the ambition is for the guys. 1982, greatest geek year ever. It's not a question, Mark. There's an exclamation point. <laughs> I had a ton of great rewards and opportunities, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, great posters and, and, and exclusive artwork and chances to talk to us and join the podcast and all kinds of fun stuff. So, yeah, I think on Kickstarter. really, if you're an aspiring creator, uh, there are some great uh, opportunities, I guess, to kind of maybe, you know, talk story pitching or something. Am I wrong? Or okay, not so much story pitching, but career advice, things like that. So, OK. Um, a lot of, lot of opportunities and, um, hopefully, you know, but the best thing to me is like the chance to see this movie come to fruition because I think it'll be pretty special. Absolutely. And then in uh, just a couple of weeks, it'll be secrets of the force. Looking forward to that. And, uh, it's possible Pandora might be coming back for a third season. <laughs> nope. My lips are sealed. <laughs> We're not sure, but, uh, no, Mark, honestly, really appreciate your time tonight. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you'll come back. I'd love to talk yeah, to you more okay. about this. I, I'd be, it'd, be, it'd be fun. This is a lot of fun, John. All right. Well, hang on for a second because I do want to give you my recommendation because I think oh, you're yeah. great on your... Uh, sounds good. Your... All right. Everybody, thanks a lot for watching. Sunday night, uh, Fabian... Is it Sunday that I'm talking to Fabian? I believe so. Fabian Nicieza, co-creator of Deadpool, is going to be talking about a lot of stuff with us. So look forward to that this week.